something that's been on my heart for, well, I mean, it is my heart. <laughs> I love to worship. And, um, and it's just, for me, it's just about just being so grateful and thankful for the Lord and what he's done in my life because he's done a lot. <laughs> he's done a lot. And I think that sometimes when we see each other, you know, face to face on Sunday mornings, we forget that we each have a journey and that most of our journeys probably have had some hurt and some pain and some suffering along with times of celebration and times of goodness, you know? And so it's that, it's that journey that just makes me so passionate about worship. So I just wanted to share with you guys, um, you know, what the word says about worship, what God's word says about worship and what worship is and, and a little bit of, um, you know, my story and what worship means to me. So, um, I just want to pray real quick. I know Rod prayed for me, but Lord God, we just, we ask you to come and have your way. Holy Spirit, just like we were singing this morning, we just pray that you would fill this place. And Lord God, I just ask that you speak through me whatever it is that you want to say. I pray that our hearts would be open to receive your truth and that those seeds would be planted and bring fruit for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So I just wanted to start today, um, kind of like I was saying, uh, sharing with you part of the reason why I wanted to share is because throughout my life, well, I've, I've been on worship teams, which that's not, that's just a tiny percentage of what worship is. Um, but I have been on worship teams since I was um, in grade school. Honestly, it was probably middle school. And throughout the years, as, um, as I've brought friends to church or got to know people and invited them to come, I've got a lot of questions about worship. You know, I've had people ask me, why do we sing songs in church? Why do you guys sing songs in church? Like, why do people, why is that person raising their hands? Like, why is that person getting down on their knees, you know? Um, why do we, why do you guys worship? You know, and I remember one lady asked one time, I had brought her to a women's conference, and, um, you know, we were doing worship, and there was just this time of worship where the Lord was just moving, and we were just singing, like, the same line of the song over and over, you know? And she asked me afterwards, she's like, why do you guys keep singing the same thing over and over again, you know? And, but those are normal questions for people who don't know, you know, who the Lord is and why we worship him. And honestly, I think there's a lot of those of us, myself included, that have been raised, you know, in church and stuff. I think sometimes we forget why we worship. So this morning, I just wanted to, to share about that. So um, you're going to see worship throughout the entire Bible, and it's actually referenced 8,629 times, which is a pretty big deal. And now, I don't believe that that's the actual word worship. I think it's just worship as a whole, like what it means, because as, as I'm going to explain, there's different words um, that the Bible uses to, um, to show bringing God glory and honor. So one of my favorite um, verses, which I feel like kind of explains the heart of worship, is Psalms 103, 1 through 5. It says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. If I could say what's one verse that explains what worship is to me, that would be the passage. And when I read that passage, I think about that first line, let all that I am praise the Lord. And I just have to ask myself, okay, what is all that I am? 
What is that? What does that mean when it says, let all that I am praise the Lord? And to me, it's my attitude, it's my emotions, it's my words, it's my actions, it's my character, who I am, it's even my plans and my goals and my desires. That's all that I am. And all that I am, my whole heart should praise the Lord. So what is worship? The definition in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says that worship is to honor or show reverence for, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor or devotion. The thing that I love about worship is that it's twofold. And that's that's just the goodness of our God because worship is what we give to God. It's what we give but it results in what we receive because that's, that's who he is. He's a good, good father. The word says every good and perfect gift comes down from him. So he gives when we give. Um, so in worship, some of the things that we give is we give appreciation, we give gratitude, we give affirmation to the Lord, we give humility, we choose humility and surrender and trust and faith, we're trusting him, we're giving him our trust, we're, we're putting our faith in him. Then some of the things that we receive is healing, physical healing, emotional healing. I've, I've been a part of so many worship services where someone didn't even go and pray for someone. Somebody there had, you know, was sick or had, you know, a hurt leg and just during worship they had complete healing in their body. Another, other things we receive are peace, his peace, his restoration. He restores as we're worshiping. He restores us. Um, we receive a light yoke and burden because his burden is easy and his yoke is light. So, you know, that heaviness that we might sometimes come into worship with, we, he takes that. We give that. If we choose to let go of that, then he replaces it with his lightness. We receive power during worship. We receive transformation, freedom, freedom where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Um, Chains are broken during worship. And that's not always comfortable though, you know, because sometimes worship makes us uncomfortable, you know, and there's a lot of people who um, they don't really care for worship. And I think sometimes that's because it makes us uncomfortable. But what that reminds me of is physical therapy. You know? If, sorry, I keep saying, you know. <laughs> it's, one of, it's like Scott's anywho. <laughs> um, you know, if you get hurt and you've, you know, broken a bone or whatever, you have, end up doing physical therapy. And the physical therapy is to help you to heal. It's to stretch you. It's to work that muscle and strengthen that muscle. And it's, so it's a good thing because without that physical therapy, you might not walk the same. I remember when Azrael broke her ankle, she had to do a lot of physical therapy. And they were talking about how it was so important because she had to stretch those tendons. And if she didn't, put in the work to do that physical therapy, if she wasn't willing to be uncomfortable, it could affect the way that she walked for the rest of her life. And that sometimes happens in worship. When the Lord's breaking those chains, he's he's removing things that don't need to be there. But sometimes those things are things that we've we've gotten comfortable with. You know, we're we're comfortable with, you know, oh my anxiety. You know, we've claimed it as our own and we've taken it as our own and it's been with us for so long, we're just not wanting to let it go. We're not wanting to be stretched, you know, but it's so necessary. So sometimes worship is uncomfortable, but uncomfortable doesn't mean bad. (laughs) Even though here in America, we think that, you know, it's like God's good, but if he calls me to anything uncomfortable, then he's not being good. (laughs) Well, that's not truth. That's not truth. Um, Okay, so I want to go through a few scriptures um, to kind of explain worship or to show worship 
in the Bible and um, share the Greek and the Hebrew words so you guys can see the difference um, with different words that are used to, um, you know, represent bringing glory to the Lord. So the first one is John 4, 23 through 24. And I did, ha- Becky graciously printed off a sheet um, for me in the foyer if you guys would like to grab it after the service uh, and take it home, you know, because it has the scripture references that I'm using. And then it will also have a whole bunch more that I won't even mention today because, like I said, it's in there 8,000 times. So <laughs> we'd be here for weeks if I tried to go through every one. So, but I wanted you guys to have it if you wanted to look further into it. So John 4, 23 through 24, it says, But a time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I'm going to try to say the Greek word. I apologize if anyone is seasoned in Greek, if I butcher it. Um, The word worship here is the Greek word proskune, proskuneo, excuse me, proskuneo. And it's, if you want to look it up in the concordance, the Strong's Concordance, it's G4352. And it means, now don't get grossed out. It means to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. To crouch or to bow. To adore. Reverent admiration and deep respect. So it's pretty intimate, you know? I mean, if you think about letting your pup lick your hand, it it may not be that big of a deal, but if some random person came and tried to lick your hand, you might have some issues. (laughs) So it's a pretty intimate thing. Um, another, another verse that um, I want to share is Hebrews thirteen fifteen, And it says, Let us, therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And that word praise there is inesis, in the Greek, and it's G133, and it means a thank offering, a thank offering, so thanksgiving, giving thanks, and so that, that's the word praise, and so we come and we praise and we worship him. Another verse is Psalm 717. It says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. So the word praise here means something a little different. This word is Hebrew, and it's yada, and it's H3034 in the Strong Concordance. And it actually means hold out the hand to revere or worship with extended hands, to confess the name of God and give praise and thanks. So that's a perfect example of raising of the hands, you know, holding out your hands. And I think a lot of times when we do that, it's a sign of surrender. You know, we're, we're surrendering, we're letting go of things. Okay, I want to share one more. Is Isaiah 25.1. It says, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. So here, the word praise is in this, but the word exalt is in this, which is another form of worship. And so I wanted to touch on the word exalt. And it's the Hebrew, and it means, or it's pronounced room. And it's H7311, and it means to raise, to lift up, to set on high, or to promote. So when I think of that, like to promote, I think of worship in our everyday lives. Because worship is not just Sunday morning. Worship is not just about singing songs. 
It's not just about coming to church and putting in your 30 minutes once a week. Worship is a way of life. And when we exalt the Lord in our life, we promote him above everything and everyone else. He takes place. He is our all. He is our number one priority. And, you know, that's one thing that I'm constantly trying to keep myself in check with. You know, each week I'm like, okay, Lord, have I exalted anything above you this week? Show me where I've exalted things above you, whether it's been my own desires of like the Lord saying, hey, I want to hang out with you. And I'm like, I'm really tired and I really just want to veg out and watch Netflix, (laughs) you know, and which we do that sometimes, but it's so good to examine ourselves and to make sure that he is, you know, our priority in life. So another thing that um, I wanted to touch on, because through the years, this is something that I've also gotten a lot of, and I've heard a lot I've heard this a lot, and I myself have struggled with this to where I have made worship about me. You know, I go to a church and they're not playing the songs that I like or the songs that I want to hear. Or, you know, they don't turn their music up loud enough or, or they're, you know, they need to turn their music down or worship lasts way too long. Like, why are they dragging it out? Like, um you know, our personal preferences. And we have to be really, really careful there because it's really not about us at all. It's not about us at all. Obviously, the Lord is loving and he's good and he meets us there and he gives to us because he always takes care of us. But it's, it's about him. It's about glorifying him and praising him. It's not about us. And I remember one time when Nathan and I, well, actually we've been married for a while, but it was after his mom got um, remarried. We went to visit her and her husband and we went to this church and it was a teeny tiny little church in a very small town. And um, I mean, there maybe was like 10 people there and their worship was simply singing hymns out of the hymnal. Now, I'm not knocking hymns, okay? I grew up, part of my childhood was Baptist, and we rocked some hymns, okay? (laughs) And I love hymns still, and I do try to incorporate those in our worship because the lyrics are usually just so full of his word. But it was, it was kind of just, it felt dead, you know? And and we're, we're singing these hymnals, and I just, I didn't feel the Lord in his presence. And I was kind of starting to nitpick in my head, like, like, whatever, you know, I don't even remember what I was thinking, but it was just negative, you know. And I felt like the Lord just told me, really? Really? I mean, he talks to me like that, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes he has to get through my thick head, so... And he's like, you can worship me by yourself in your bedroom. What's the problem here? It's about the choice. Either you're going to sing these hymns with all that you are and with all that your heart, or you're going to choose not to. But this church needs nothing to allow you to worship. And it just really convicted me and it changed me. And from that point on, anytime that spirit tried to come up in me that wanted to criticize the way a church did worship or try to put it in a box, the Lord would always take me back to that and remind me that that it's about him and that's what it's about. Psalms 104 is another one of my favorite verses. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. And the word praise in here actually um, means something different as well. It means a song of praise. 
So this is actually talking about coming to his courts with a song, with a song of praise. The reason I love this verse is because I feel like it, it's kind of a perfect outline of worship. It breaks it down. You know, it shows us that we should be joyful. We come into his gates with thanksgiving. And that's a part of what can break bondages, too, because, because that's a choice. That's where you make the choice. I think that's also why it's called a sacrifice of praise, because there are plenty of times in my life where it has not been a season of, of thanksgiving. <laughs> It has not been a season of joyfulness. And in those moments, we choose, I'm going to enter your presence, Lord, with thanksgiving. And there's always something to thank him for. Because he sent Jesus to give us eternal life. And if he does nothing else, that was enough. So we have every reason to be thankful. The other part of this is, that I love is that you're acknowledging God, okay? To come and to give thanks to him, you have to acknowledge him. And and many times um, we forget to do that. We go about our day and we go about our life and we get stressed out and we start being weighed down with weariness. And it's because we haven't turned and looked at him. We haven't acknowledged him. We haven't brought us into that moment or brought him into our day. So acknowledging him is an important step. Um, And the last thing I love about this verse is how it says, his unfailing love continues forever. His faithfulness continues for generations. It never runs out. So what he's telling us here is not only can we count on him for ourselves, but we can count on him for our children We can count on him for our grandchildren because his faithfulness is lasting long after we're gone. One thing I wanted to touch on, um, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, and like I said, I I have a sheet out there if you want to look it up because I'm not going to read every single verse here. But um, the second thing I want to talk about is the ways, the way that we worship, the ways that we worship. And there's a lot of different expressions of worship, okay? Just as each of us express ourselves differently in life, you know, when you're talking to a friend, you may have someone that's very eccentric, and when they get excited, like, it's all over their face, you know? It's all over their body language. I mean, they're just, you know, you can't deny their excitement. And then there's other people who get excited and maybe are not that expressive. You know, well, in the same way, there's different ways that um, that we can express worship. I wanted to touch on these just because I want to make it clear that these things are biblical. You know, if there's ever a question, and I have had questions, I have had people try to tell me that certain expressions of worship are wrong, and that's just not the truth. If it's in the Word, it's in the Word, and the Word is infallible. So, um, different expressions of worship: kneeling or bowing. And you can find that in Psalms 95, 6. Um, Lifted hands, which we already kind of talked about. You can find that in Psalms 134, 2. Psalms 63, 4. And 1 Timothy 2, 8. And obviously you'll be able to find these things in other scriptures as well. But I'm just giving you one or two. Um, Dancing. You can find that in Psalms 149, 3 and 4. Clapping of the hands, that is in Psalms 47, 1. Shouting, that's Isaiah in Isaiah 12, 6, excuse me. And Revelations 19, 6 through 7. And that's one, I am not, as I am one of those persons that I'm not super expressive. Like, I don't like, I've never been one of those persons that like, just shows extreme excitement and gets all like yell you know yelling and like "Ah!" like I just I've never been like that and my husband's had to learn that over the years because there's times that he gives me gifts and he surprises me and you know I have to reassure him that I love it and I'm very excited but um however and I wanted to share this because it's not about personality either you know I've been explaining the difference in personality but God 
takes us to places far beyond our personality. Our personality is sometimes what we get comfortable with, you know? And shouting is not something that my personality would lean itself towards. (laughs) I'm not someone that would shout out. But there have been times in worship, and even times here, and I have to repent because the couple of times here that it happened, I did not allow myself to, I did not surrender to the Lord, and I did not let it out. But there have been times in worship where it's just like, you can't contain it. You know, there's a, there's a worship song that says, I'll shout out your name from the rooftops I'll proclaim. And there are times in worship where that's happened to me where it's just like bubbling up inside me. And it, it makes no sense, but I just want to shout out, you know, hallelujah or, or whatever is in my heart. And so that's not about personality. This isn't about personality. Your expressions of worship are not about your personality. It's just different ways that you choose to show the Lord that you love him. Singing is another way we worship. Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 and Psalms 95.1. And silence is another way that we worship. You see that in Habakkuk 2.20. So sometimes you are honoring God by sitting still and keeping your mouth shut. <laughs> You know, he, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes it's, we need to quit saying so much and we just need to be quiet and be silent and give him honor and allow him to speak to us. And that is also a form of worship. Another thing that I wanted to kind of touch on is the atmosphere of worship. So, um, and, I, and I'm kind of referring to this when it comes to congregational worship. Uh, so this is when, you know, you're worshiping in church and with a congregation. When, when we set aside and we designate time for worship, um, the atmosphere should be an atmosphere of honor. And the best way that I can give an example is thinking about, there's two different things that, that make me think about atmospheres. One is like a memorial to honor a soldier who's given his life. If this soldier gave his life for you, you know, if you watched your buddy that was a soldier die so that you could live and you were at that memorial to honor that soldier, you wouldn't be messing around. You wouldn't be talking and laughing, playing on your phone. You wouldn't. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, of getting distracted in worship and doing something or seeing my phone light up that a text message, I'm like, I'm just gonna check real quick and see who that is. But that's not the atmosphere of worship because it's all about him. It's all about honoring and showing him respect. Another way that I think about atmosphere of worship is like a wedding because, you know, a memorial is solemn usually, and worship isn't always solemn. It's not always a solemn place. There are times where I've experienced the Holy Spirit filling a place and people being overcome with laughter, you know, and obviously at a soldier's memorial, that would not be appropriate. So the other thing I think about is a wedding, you know, a wedding celebration, but the focus is still on the bride and the groom you know, and with the heart of worship, our focus should always be on God. The atmosphere should always be focused on him. You don't try to draw attention to yourself, you know, at at a memorial service or at a wedding. If you're the best man of a groomsman or the maid of honor, you're not going to be up on stage like, look at me, look at me, I'm here, you know, like, silly, like, you're going to be focused on the bride and the groom. And that's humility. The heart of worship is humility because it's not about us. Our heart's motive should be to honor God and to not draw attention to ourselves. Now, sometimes in surrendered worship, odd things can happen. (laughs) Things that make us uncomfortable, 
you know, and kind of like Nathan said in his message, there may be times where someone's expressing, expressing, excuse me, expressing worship in a way that causes, you know, it's catching your eye or if there's movement and you're struggling with being distracted, just close your eyes. Because whether that person's heart motive is to draw attention to themselves or to bring honor to God is not our problem. That's the Lord's to deal with. And we just keep our focus on him. This scripture, John three twenty nine through 30, it says, It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. The bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. And this verse is John the Baptist talking about Jesus. But I think it's wonderful because I think it portrays the perfect depiction of what worship looks like. It's us becoming less and less. And, and that's something that I think for worship leaders, that is so important. You know, as a worship leader, it's our, it's, we get the privilege of helping to lead and usher people into the presence of God. And it should always be about pointing people to look to him. Um, I wanted to touch on this for just a second because I feel like that this gets misunderstood a lot. So a part of the word reverence is sometimes the word fear is also used. It, you know, the Bible talks about fearing the Lord. And... Um, And so I kind of wanted to break down what that means because I thought if you guys do go and and start looking up some of, you know, these words, you might see that, like worship and fear the Lord. Um, One verse that I love that uses the word fear is Psalms 25, 14. It says, the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him and he will make them know his covenant. Those who fear him. Fear of the Lord is respect. So the analogy that the Lord has used with me when he's been teaching me about this is a a train. You know, you're not going to go and stand out on a railroad track when a train is coming. Are you? I mean, think about it. No, you're not. Why not? Because you fear the train hitting you. You fear that. And that fear is motivated by a respect and awareness of the train's sheer power. You respect the power of the train and know what it's capable of. It's a healthy fear. It's good to have that fear. It's good for children to have a fear of a car. You know, when you're raising your babies and you tell them, do not go out in the road without holding my hand. Do not cross the street. And if they cross the street, you whip their butt. Or at least that's what my parents did with me and I did with my children because I wanted that spanking to make them remember the gravity of what it meant if that car hit them. I wanted them to have a fear of the car, a healthy fear. And we're supposed to fear the Lord. We're supposed to have a healthy fear to know his power and to know what he is capable of, which are really good things, but he's also a just God and we have to honor that. Um, It's not the kind of fear that would cause you to run and hide from God. God does not want us to fear him to where we hide from him. You see that in Genesis 3, 8 and 10, where Adam and Eve, it says they hid from the Lord. And when God says, why did you hide from me? They said, we were afraid because we were naked. They were afraid because of shame. They felt shame. And shame causes us to try to hide from the Lord, which is the opposite of what we need when we're carrying shame. We need him to find us. You know, we need him to, we need to be near him so that he can break off that shame. So I just wanted to, kind of clarify that. And you guys can study those words. I didn't go into deep study of every word fear in the Bible where it tells us to fear the Lord. So feel free to do that. 
there are a lot of other ways that we worship. Kind of like I was saying, worship is not all about just singing songs. It's not about always coming on a Sunday morning. That's not all that it is. We worship every day in our lives by how we represent God. And I did want to read a few scriptures because I think that the Bible does a great job, surprisingly, of showing us worship, ways that we worship outside of singing songs and, and um, on Sunday mornings. Another way that we worship the Lord is sacrifice and surrender. Surrender and sacrifice are forms of worship. If you look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, Says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way that we worship him. So that's surrender, surrender of our bodies, surrender of who we are. Another way that we worship is giving you look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It says, you must decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And so that's not just giving money, giving our time, giving love to others, giving forgiveness when we feel someone doesn't deserve forgiveness, when they've wronged us and they're not even upset about it, when they're not even sorry about it, to forgive someone that has wounded us, that doesn't even care, is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of praise. And it's, it's giving, which is showing God our worship. Working, which this seems to be becoming an issue in our nation right now. <laughs> Nobody wants to seem to work. And... My dad used to always tell me that the Bible says, if you don't work, you don't eat. (laughs) And it does say that in different words, but working is important. Um, Colossians 3, 17 says, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And if you continue reading to verse 23, It says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. So us working brings him praise. When we do what God asks us to do, we're honoring him and we're worshiping him. The Lord, you know, taught me something new about this when I was a stay-at-home mom, when my girls were little. Because I was in a season of my life where (laughs) I was up, as I'm sure any of you who are mothers understand. I was up in the middle of the night dealing with a hungry baby, to be woken up in the morning dealing with hungry children, and throw up and dirty diapers and Cheerios all over the floor, even though I swore I would never let my children walk around with snacks. You are trying to survive. (laughs) I'm like, I changed my mind. Here's a cup of Cheerios. (laughs) Go watch cartoons. You know, and so you're just trying to survive. I mean, half the time Nathan would get home, you know, and I'm trying to cook dinner and I'm still in my pajamas. Like, shower? What is that? (laughs) And in those seasons, it was like I, I had to get little nuggets of the Lord. You know, like I couldn't even go to the bathroom by myself, okay, people? (laughs) Like, so I would just play worship music, you know, in the kitchen and get the girls to dance with me and sing the worship songs. You know, I would have a teaching going that I would have to pause 50 times and rewind because I couldn't remember what was said, you know? And, And I would have a little devotional that might take two minutes to read. And I was just doing my best to get his truth in me. But I felt so discouraged because I felt, Lord, I am doing nothing for you. Like, what am I doing for you, Lord? How am I bringing you any glory? I'm here covered in throw up, can't even keep my house clean. Like, how, like, I feel, I just felt so discouraged, you know? Like, and then you would hear these stories about somebody out on a missions field and, you know, a thousand people coming to Jesus. And, and I was just crying to him one day because I just 
felt useless, you know? I couldn't even, I couldn't even feel like I was keeping up with motherhood. And the Lord was reminding me of this verse, of working under the Lord. And he was telling me, you bring me honor every day because you sacrifice yourself for your children so that you can feed them, that you can clothe them, that you can teach them about me, that you can love on them. And it really brought worship to a different place for me and really showed me how it is important in every little facet of our lives, we get to worship him. Another way that we worship him is through our obedience. So Psalms 102 says, Worship the Lord with gladness and come before him singing with joy. And then also Psalms 119 33 and 34 says, Teach me your decrees, O Lord. I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding and I will obey your instructions. I will put them into practice with all my heart. He calls us to worship. There are so many verses in the Bible that tell us, Worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It tells us to come into his courts with thanksgiving and praise. You know, he, it is something he asks us to do. He asks us to worship him. And we do worship him with our obedience, with our obedience of actually choosing to worship him, with our obedience to do the things he's asking us to do, whether that means talking to a coworker that really gets on your nerves and you just don't really like them, but the Lord's told you to reach out to them and to love them, you know, if it means forgiving your husband when he's really getting on your nerves, you know, it's like whatever it is that the Lord is asking you to do in those moments, if you are obedient, you are showing worship to the Lord. You are worshiping him. So that is what is worship and that is the ways that we worship. Another thing is why do we worship? And I touched on that a tiny bit before, but I wanted to share a little bit of um, my why, why I worship. One of the many things. I mean, there are many things in my life and reasons that the Lord continues to bring me back to worship. But um, I was born and raised in the church, and... Um, my grandparents were really solid in the Lord. My, my parents had me when they were 16. So you can imagine what that was like. And they did not have everything together. Um, my dad actually uh, was a drug addict. He um, ended up becoming a drug addict. And so my home life was extremely unstable. But, well, in the early years, the Lord freed my father from drugs, and he's been serving the Lord ever since. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, but my grandparents were really a steady part of my life. They would pick me up on Sunday mornings and bring me to church. You know, when my parents weren't going, they always came and got me and, and took me to church. And, um, and so I always had, I was, always had the privilege to be exposed to his truth and his word. You know, not everyone has that privilege. Even in America, there are many, many kids that have never heard the name of Jesus or that have not ever gone to church. But I had that privilege, and um, I had seasons in my life where I was fully surrendered to him, and then I definitely had seasons where I was doing my own thing. And one area of my life that even in the seasons where I surrendered so much of my life to him, and I was just doing my best to love him and serve him as a teen, I never could seem to let go of relationships with boys. It was like one of those things where it was just like, I'm doing this my way, you know? I was desperate for affection and attention, you know, having my dad be kind of absent in the home growing up. um, I was always looking for it in the wrong places. And So I was dating a guy in high school, and he was just, he he wasn't like some horrible person that did drugs or, you know, something outwardly obvious. But um, when I started dating him, my dad told me, 
when you brought him over to meet us, I just heard in my spirit, no. Like, so strong. And he told me that, and of course, I'm like, you don't know, you know, you don't know him, you know. And um, I didn't heed my dad's, you know, warning, the Lord's warning. And I dated this guy, and everything was great in the beginning, but things kind of started to spiral um, as time went on. And I chose to follow him to college, so I chose to leave the college I was going to, which was a Christian university, and go to the secular college that he was going to because I wanted to be close to him. And, um, and my parents let me make that choice, um, which I'm thankful that they did, which is another hard thing as a parent sometimes, allowing your children to make choices instead of making those choices for them, even though you know they're wrong, <laughs> because sometimes some of us just need to learn the hard way. And so they let me. They let me follow him to that college. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but basically I ended up getting completely broken. My heart broken. I, my self-esteem was just beaten down. Um, there was just a lot of horrible things that happened in that semester at college. And I was just laying on my dorm floor just, sobbing. And I just was like, Lord, if you'll have me, (laughs) I'm ready. I'm ready for real this time. I'm done doing this on my own. I'm done doing it my own way. I'm I'm ready to surrender to you. And I called my daddy. (laughs) And of course, my dad, being an example of the Heavenly Father's love, accepted me with open arms, told me that I could move back home, and um, just helped me get on my feet. And I'll never forget the Lord's goodness and mercy. That is one of my wives that I worship. And it honestly, it wasn't long after that that I met the beautiful bald man back there running the sound. woo <laughs> um, And... And even that was a testimony because I had it in my head, like, okay, I have been disobedient to the Lord for years of my life with this. I have refused to surrender relationships to him. And I didn't know that this was what I, this was, what I was believing, but he later showed me, this isn't in my notes, but I feel like I should share it. I was thinking it's going to be forever until I meet the man that I'm supposed to marry. Because I... I grew up with a mama's heart. All I wanted growing up was to be a wife and a mother. Like that was my deepest heart's desires. And which I think is part of the reason why I took relationships into my own hands because I was so busy trying to make it happen. But I just thought you you might as well just grit your teeth and get ready to dig your feet in because it's going to be a long time before the Lord gives you a man. (laughs) You know, you've been so disobedient. And it wasn't. (laughs) I mean, it was like pretty quickly after I surrendered, the Lord brought Nathan into my life. And I was struggling with it because I felt like that Nathan was from the Lord, but I was like, it's too soon. Like you, you know, and I felt like the Lord said, it's because you, you are believing a lie that I was going to punish you, which isn't true because all I asked was that you surrender. And you chose surrender. And I was just waiting for you to choose surrender. And when you did, I came in with my goodness. And I just feel like there's somebody here that needed to hear that. Um, Now, I'm not negating consequence of choice. I clearly had consequence of those years of not surrendering. I had wounds and I had pain and we had things we had to work through because of insecurities. But every good comes from the, every good gift comes from the Father and he doesn't withhold. He doesn't withhold from us to punish us. If he did that, he would have never given Jesus because we were not worthy. We were not worthy of Jesus, but he chose to give him anyway. So so I wanted to read Psalm 66, 16 through 20. 
says, Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. For I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. And so those are the verses that are a reminder for me of that moment in my life of surrender to the Lord. Excuse me. Another very important reason why we worship is because worship is warfare. And we need it to be victorious. We have to have it to be victorious. Um, Joshua 6, I want to read read these verses real quick. So I'm sure many of you have probably heard this story. This is the story of the Battle of Jericho. It says, the of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priest blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. And so basically, Joshua did that. Um, It says on the seventh day, if you go down to verse 15, on the seventh day, the Israelites, Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared for she protected our spies. And so he's giving them more more instruction. And so they did. They marched around and I'm not going to read the whole thing. They marched around that seventh time and they blasted the ram's horns and shouted and the walls came down because worship is warfare. And the, the horn that they actually blew um, is the shofar. I got so excited last week when Scott starts pulling all these things out of a bag and he pulls out a shofar because I had been studying that for this message. Um, and the thing that's neat about the shofar is it's been something used in worship. Um, It sounded the Sabbath day, it announced the new moon, and it proclaimed the anointing of a new king, kind of like Scott was talking about. And um, Rosh Hashanah, I probably didn't say that right, but that was also the shofar sounded in the synagogue to call people to a spiritual awakening. It was a call to worship. And the shofar, and this, this was something Scott was kind of sharing with me, it does something to the atmosphere. Like the Jewish people talk about how the shofar does something to the atmosphere. The shofar was sounded at the Battle of Jericho, and it does something in the atmosphere. It breaks through. The sound of that horn breaks through things. And I think it's a great depiction of worship because worship breaks through. It changes the atmosphere and it changes us. And it's it's something that is so important um, for victory. You know, the thing that I thought was interesting um, there is that they all were armored up. Okay, they did not put on their armor. They all had their armor on. You know, the Bible talks about us putting on the armor of God. They all had their armor on. But then they went into battle with worship. They began battle with worship. And once they worshiped, the walls were broken down 
then they were able to reach and defeat their enemy. Had they not worshipped, had they not sounded the shofar and shout, shouted out to the Lord, something would have been hindering them from getting to their enemy. They couldn't have even got to their enemy to defeat their enemy. And I feel like we can see that in our own lives. You know, there's many times that we're armored up. We're like, I'm in the word. Like, I'm reading the word. Lord, I'm speaking your word out over my family or over my children. And, and why isn't anything happening? You know, why am I not seeing victory? And it's because we've forgotten to begin with worship. And there's still a wall there. There's still an obstacle there. And I think there are times where those walls and obstacles might be things that the enemy has put in our way. But then there are times that those walls and obstacles are things in our own life. You know, our sins in our own life. And having that time to come into his presence and worship him is a time where he reveals those things to us. And he's able to, you know, remove those things from our life. I've seen that in times uh, with praying for my children. Like one thing that I've determined in my life is to pray for my children. You know, the Lord had showed me, well, he reminded me of the scripture in Ephesians where it talks about how we don't fight against flesh and blood, but how we fight against the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness. So if we're not fighting against flesh and blood, then we can't use weapons of flesh and blood. And... So I began to start, this was years ago when my girls were little, I began to start speaking his word over my children, and and he helped me to find just different scriptures and Bible verses to just proclaiming his word, because his word does not return void. And I started doing that, um, and I still do that today. And so there, there are times where I come, and it's like I get in that routine, and it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pray over my kids, you know, and it's like, mark it off my list, you know, and, um, and I just will feel a hindrance. It's like, I'm not getting anywhere. And the Lord has to remind me, you, you didn't come to me in worship. Or, I mean, sometimes there's times where weeks will go by (laughs) and I'll be speaking his word over my children and we'll be having, you know, battles with, this child or that child or they're going through something or dealing with something and I'm praying and I'm like why are we not getting breakthrough why are we not getting breakthrough you know and then the Lord reminds me like you got to come to me and worship you know and and one time recently that happened and I just started I just repented I'm like Lord I'm sorry I'm sorry that I started trying to control this myself because I was trying to use those scriptures to get results that I wanted. I was even using his word to try to control the outcome of my child. And so I just repented and, and I was just started worshiping him. And I started singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. And that just started coming up in me. And I ended up having an incredible encounter with the Lord that maybe someday I will share, but Something was broken in that, my room that morning, you know, and the Lord showed me, you had a wall, and that wall was pride, and that wall was control. You were holding your child in a death grip because you were not coming to me in worship and surrender. And when I did that, things began to change. Walls began to come down, and things began to break things began to break off. It wasn't a magic, it's not a magic pill, you know, it wasn't overnight that, like, I had a whole new child, (laughs) you know. It took time, and, but things began to change. So we worship him because it's our warfare. It's our weapon, and we need it. We worship him because of who he is, because of who God is. Um, I have this book, And this is actually the prayer book, but there's a book called um, The Names of God by Tony Evans. And I love it because you don't, or I didn't, realize how huge God is. 
and how he is so many things to us. But if you, if you ever look it up, if you're struggling to worship, try to find who God is. And this book is, is one that's good for it because it has all the names in the Hebrew and the Greek, which I would not even try to read because I would butcher them all. But some of them you're probably remember, or familiar with, like Shalom, our Prince of Peace, um, El Shaddai, um, different names. But God is so much to us and it helps us to worship him our why if we know who he is. So he's the God of mercy. He's the most high God. He's the faithful God. He's the God of our strength. He's the Lord, the judge, our prince of peace. The Lord will provide Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. Um, so yeah, he, wonderful counselor. He's the Lord, my deliverer. I mean, there's so much of who he is. And so looking up the names of God is, is helpful sometimes, you know, to, to know why you're worshiping. We also worship him because of what he has done for us. Um, so who he is and what he has done for us. And a lot of times we can get hung up on worshiping him only for what he's done for us and not for who he is. So we have to be careful there because we like to cling to the things that are tangible and we forget, you know, the person of God. But um, we worship him because the Bible tells us to. We, you know, we already kind of talked about that, but Matthew twenty two thirty seven says, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So our desires, our thoughts, our wills, our emotions, our spirit, our entire being, we should be loving him with that and worshiping him with that. Um, in Romans fourteen eleven. And Isaiah 45, 23, it talks about how every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. So one day, every person who lives and who has ever lived will worship the Lord because he is worthy of that glory and honor and he will receive it. Um, you know, and this is just my opinion, but I was thinking about those scriptures and thinking about that, like every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, you know? So it's talking about people who have said there is no God, you know? Every, I mean, it's not just talking about them, but it's talking about every person, a person that's said all their life, God isn't real, will bow, and they will confess that he is the Lord. And so I was thinking about that, and I thought, Lord, how is, you know, like trying to understand it, you know, because my mind was thinking forced, you know, like, you know, making somebody do something. And I just felt like that the Lord reminded me of a storm, you know, and powerful winds of a storm. And how sometimes the gust of winds are so strong. I don't know if you've ever been out and about, like when a thunderstorm starts to roll in, you know, and the wind gusts and you have to like hold on to something to brace yourself to keep from getting knocked over. That's kind of what I was thinking of about when I was imagining that day when every knee will bow, that the sheer power and magnitude of God's greatness, it will not be as if he's forcing his hand. It will not be because someone said, you must. It will be because you can't do anything else. You know, like the gust of the wind of a tornado, you're going to get on your face because you can't stand up because of the magnitude of it. And so, like I said, that's just my opinion, but that's kind of what I was thinking of, you know, when I was thinking of that. So um, I wanted to kind of end today. There's, like I said, a lot more scriptures out in the foyer on different types of worship, but um, I wanted to end today just sharing a vision that the Lord had given me one day and he showed me that it, he ended up showing me what it meant and that it had to do with worship. And it just felt like it was, it was so good to me because it just depicted God's longing and heart for our worship. You know, what he longs for in us. So I, I just saw thousands of children 
and they were all gathered together and they were in in the streets, you know, and they're all just being kids, you know, they're talking and they're laughing and they're really excited about something, you know, and, and I'm like, what are they excited about? And they're smiling and, you know, talking and, and just full of excitement. And some of them were running, like sprinting in one direction. And some of them were just kind of walking fast and, you know, kind of like, hurry, hurry, come on, come on, come on. And they were hustling forward and, and then I saw it and they were running because they were going to get to sing to Jesus. And they were overcome with joy and excitement to get to bring their song to him. They were giddy at the thought, just the thought of getting to sing to Jesus. They were just giddy with excitement. And we're so excited to be able to please him. And the Lord was kind of reminding me when I was seeing this of when I was a child and I would have like an elementary choir performance, you know, (laughs) and my parents and grandparents would come and, and I remember being young and just being so excited to get to sing for my parents and grandparents, knowing that they were going to be there um, because I wanted to please them. I wanted them to be pleased with me and I already knew that they would be pleased. I already knew it because they loved me. So I knew that they would be pleased. And I knew that I was theirs and that they were there for me. They weren't there to see some other kid sing. They were there for me. And I was always excited and filled with joy to get to share my songs with them. That's the heart of worship that God longs for in us. The other thing that I thought was so important that the Lord pointed out to me is that as, as a child that was coming to sing for my parents, I wasn't worried or concerned with anyone else's place in the choir. I wasn't concerned whether I was on the front row or not. I wasn't concerned if... I was, whether I was singing a solo or not, there were many times where if they gave solos, another kid had a solo. And my parents were still there, and they were still there to hear me. I wasn't worried about others. All I was concerned about was coming for my parents and pleasing them. And that's God the Father. That's the kind of father that we have. He loves each one of us uniquely. And sometimes I think that it's really hard for us to understand as humans to wrap our mind around that. You know, when you, a lot of the times when we think of God, it's, we're thinking of him in a, in a generality, you know, because there's so many of God's children. But he loves each one of us individually and uniquely. And he comes He meets each one of us to meet with us, to meet with you. And that is his heart for worship. He sees you and we see him. So, you know, when when we know him intimately, he knows us intimately. And when we know him intimately, he's able to reveal our song to us. I just want to encourage everybody here um, to really think about worship and think about worship in their lives and what it is to them and to make a commitment to the Lord to worship. We can worship God at any stage in our journey. So whether, whether you've just met the Lord or whether you've been serving the Lord for 60 years, it doesn't matter. We can worship him at any stage Our worship does change when we know God deeply, though, because we gain more of an understanding of who he is. And so part of having a passionate worship for the Lord is getting to know the Lord intimately, getting to know him. The more that we know him, the more deeply we can worship him. You know, if you think about, like, an example that I thought of is, it's the difference of... Showing a coworker gratitude because they bring they brought a coffee to you at work, 
and showing your best friend gratitude for walking with you through a month of the hardest times of your life. Those are both thanksgiving. Thanking a friend for bringing you coffee. They both have value. Thanking a friend for walking through the hard times with you. But your gratitude for that friend is going to be so much deeper than your gratitude about a cup of coffee. Because you know them and they know you and you've been through the worst times and the best times with them. And that's how our worship is with the Lord. So I want to just encourage you to make worship a priority in your life. Um, You know, that in John 4, it was talking about how we worship him in spirit and in truth. And that to worship him, we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. We have his spirit within us when we accept Jesus. So we are able to worship him in spirit. So my challenge to you guys over the next few months is to start somewhere and make a commitment to worshiping the Lord every day. Even if it's starting small with 10 minutes a day, you know. Um, I think sometimes even as seasoned believers, we have to come back to that because we just get, sometimes we're just going through the motions and we have to come back to that. But committing to start our day thanking God you know, thanking him for something that he's done for us, and then choosing to surrender something to him, bringing our thanksgiving to him, and then bringing and surrendering something that he might show you to surrender. And then even maybe looking up a scripture that relates to what you're surrendering. I mean, this is just an idea of how you can start, you know, or how you can start back up. Um, Sometimes if if I am dealing with unforgiveness and I'm really struggling to forgive someone that's hurt me, I will look up a verse about forgiveness or about, you know, having unforgiveness and I'll write it down. I used to write it on index cards and I would carry it with me in my purse or my back pocket. And every time I would feel that, you know, cause you know how the enemy just likes to sneak in like randomly throughout your day. You know, you might just be going through your day and something triggers you and then you start, oh, well, and she did this to me. I can't believe you know, like, well, I'm going to tell her, you know, like, and in those moments when the enemy would just try to sneak that in, I would just take out that index card, and I would just read that verse over and over and over again to take me back to that place of surrender, and then thanking God that he's more than enough for you to overcome whatever you're battling. That's just one way that we can worship him throughout our lives. So let's just close in prayer. Lord God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you've given us already through Jesus. We thank you that you are more than enough for us. And Lord, we do, we want, we long and want to worship you with our life, with everything that we are, with every ounce of our being. We want to bring you glory and honor and praise because you deserve it all, Lord. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of our surrender. You're worthy of our sacrifice. And you're worthy of our praise. So we just lift you up this morning and we just pray that you would be honored and glorified through us, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes on you and to love you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name. Amen.